and welcome, my gentle and of course very modern apes, to another, I guess, episode of Gutsick Gibbon. I have an interesting thing for you today, an interesting presentation, video, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I say that a lot, but that's because it's all interesting. There is no room for boring here on Gutsick Gibbon. Today we're going to be going over a paper by Todd Wood, a young Earth creationist. Todd Wood as a young Earth creationist, generally believes that the Earth was created, more or less in its present form, 6,000 years ago, and that all of the geologic column and sort of the fossils within it were created during the Noachian Deluge, or Noah's Flood, about 4,400 years ago. And um, that's a very interesting take, isn't it? We talk a lot about young Earth creationism on the channel, duh, that's something I like to sort of delve into. Um, and something that this channel is known for that I'm, I'm quite proud of is that I try to take young earth creationism at face value. I like to look at the literature as it were and kind of delve into the methods and what I think of them. And very recently on the channel, I had a young man named Peter who is a co-author on a paper that we're going to be discussing today uh, with Todd Wood concerning hominins, which is of course the thing that I like the most. <laughs> And this is something that is quite, this is going to be interesting, I hope, because Peter posed a challenge to me during our conversation. I can't remember if it was on air or off, or off air, but what he basically said to me was, you know, I feel like you go for the low hanging fruit. And that's fair. I do tend to go for the low hanging fruit. And Todd Wood is, in my opinion, uh, not low hanging fruit. He tries, he, he does try. In this way, I would classify Todd Wood, uh, again, who is Peter's co-author on this paper, as a progressive young earth creationist. Now, a lot of people in that last video were like, what the heck does progressive young earth creationism mean? Like, what, what is that? And I would generally classify progressive young earth creationism as creationism or creationists who attempt to use sort of conventional methodology to prove their point. There are no trickery, there is no trickery going on usually in sort of the progressive creationist literature. Uh, they try to prove their point and are amicable towards conventional science in this way. And this is something that Todd Wood does a lot of and that I have a lot of respect for him for. I respect Peter as well. Peter had the courage to come on this channel and sort of argue for his point. And it was my mistake in that conversation that I didn't actually carefully read the paper that Peter's kind of using to bolster his idea uh, in that conversation. I didn't read it carefully going forward uh, before that talk. I just kind of skimmed it. And that's not generally good practice. So I told Peter, okay, you're right, I do go for low-hanging fruit. And uh, I'm going to read that paper that you and Todd Wood sort of put out there in the Answers Research Journal, which, I mean, this is no disrespect towards Peter or Todd Wood, but the Answers Research Journal is, in my opinion, not on par with conventional science journals because the peer review process is significantly less robust. Um, and we'll kind of talk more about that later. But that shouldn't diminish the actual product that, that Peter and that Todd have put out. So I'm going to take that paper that they created on hominin baromenology, and we're going to get into it. You might be thinking, okay, like I'm new to the channel, what is hominin baromenology? And baromenology kind of refers to, if you've ever heard, you know, Kent Hovind talk about biblical kinds, baromenology is sort of this attempt by Todd Wood and others to legitimize the idea of kinds. What they kind of propose is that long ago, 6,000 years ago in the Garden of Eden, God kind of created these progenitor animals, right? He created these animals that would eventually diversify into the modern groups that we see today. Uh, usually this occurs after the flood. So, you know, they diversify into some groups, the flood happens, Noah takes two of every kind of animal onto the ark, and then they hop off and hyper-diversify into their groups today. And if you're thinking, that sounds a lot like fast evolution to me, uh, you, would, you would be right. You, you would be correct on that. Um, the, really, the only main difference between baromenology and conventional evolution is that baromenology has limits. Kinds can evolve within their group, but there is no evolution between groups. So if you have a cat kind and perhaps, you know, a, a dog kind, you're not going to see a connection between those two kinds according to young earth creationists. But you can get evolution within the cat kind, so your progenitor cat can create uh, through different environmental pressures, lions and tigers and house cats and civets. Well, I guess not civets, those are viverids. Um, servals, that's what I was looking for in caracals and things like that. So this creates some interesting predictions and hypotheses, doesn't it? Now we're gonna be getting into this a bit more in a moment, but right off the bat, my problem with kinds outside of its sort of relationship to a 6,000 year old earth, which 
I think is pretty indefensible, honestly, is the fact that there are no genetic lines that we can find that separate organisms. There is no genetic line that we know of that creatures can't cross, right? So we know that bears and dogs are fairly closely related to each other, and all canids or members of the family Canidae are pretty closely related, and all members of Ursidae are pretty closely related. But we can also draw connections between families. So we can say that, for instance, Canidae or dogs are more closely related to Ursids or bears than they are to Felids. This is something that I think is problematic for young Earth creationists and their kinds, because Theoretically, right, like the kinds shouldn't be able to have any kind of relationship to one another. There should be some kind of stopgap there that, that says organisms can only evolve this much. They can't evolve more than that. And outside of Todd Wood, they tend to be young earth creationists like Answers in Genesis and the Institute for Creation Research. They tend to be really hesitant to talk about how change occurs within these kinds because it's just evolution, honestly, and they don't like to call it that. So what Todd Wood and Peter, the topic of today, what they have done is they have attempted to look at the hominins and see if they can be kind of lumped into kinds. Now, let me talk a little bit about Todd Wood and Peter and their sort of, um, their sort of philosophy. I like it, right? They created a hypothesis. They used statistical methods to try and support it. And we're going to get to kind of the results of that in a second, but they also accept conventional science in a lot of ways, right? So Peter and Todd would say that, yeah, like Australopithecines are bipeds. Most of the Australopithecines are going to be walking in ways that are quite similar to, to humans. They would say that Australopithecines are a different kind from genus Homo, which is interesting, and we'll get to that in a second, but they're not going around like Answers in Genesis and saying that Lucy is a knuckle-walking chimp, effectively, because that is, of course, anatomically indefensible, just like, in my opinion, a, a young Earth is. But I didn't talk with Peter about a young Earth. I talked with Peter about hominins and how they can or cannot be separated into clear, distinct groups, because that is the hypothesis that Todd and Peter generally made. Can hominins be lumped into distinct groups that appear to have potentially an incrossable boundary? And this is easily the most conventionally scientific attempt that I have seen out of creationism, young earth creationism with regard to the hominins. And for that, Todd and Peter have my respect. I think that they're both lovely people. Again, I'm very happy that Peter came on to talk to me. Um, and I'm going to talk about this paper now and what I think are its pros and cons. And then I'm going to try to synthesize that into an overall point about hominins and kind of how we should deal with them and what that data seems to be saying. Now, for those of you who don't know, um, I am a current PhD student in biological anthropology or the study of human evolution and primates, right? So this is something that I feel like I am educated enough to talk about. My master's was in primate biology, behavior, and conservation. I got a minor in anthropology and a minor in biology, and my undergraduate degree was a BSA in pre-professional animal science. So I think that I can offer, you know, a decent critique of the work that we're kind of about to, to consume. First, I want to illustrate what my point is going to be. I would like to, to have this in the back of your mind just so you know where I'm coming from. I am of the opinion that the kind of fossil record that we see over the past 7 million years for the hominins is remarkably smooth. What we see is morphologic change over geologic time occurring in kind of a stepwise fashion. First, we see the emergence of things like bipedality and the various anatomical and morphological structures that go along with that. I guess that was a bit redundant, but, and the morphologic structures that kind of uh, coincide or are necessary for bipedalism. And of course, we see the emergence of large brain case sizes. Usually this is around the emergence of genus Homo, but very interestingly, we start to see this divergence of big ur brains at Australopithecus sediba and into early genus Homo. So that would be what I would propose is partially what's bridging this gap, among other things between these two genera. Now, from Peter's stance and from Todd's stance, what they're going to say is they're going to say there is a distinct mark that can separate Australopithecines and genus Homo, generally speaking, into two distinct kinds. And that there is this kind of um, presumably incrossable boundary between the Australopithecines and genus Homo. And what we're seeing as this proposed by me, <laughs> smooth morphologic change through the geologic column is actually um, not present, and it's perhaps an artifact or a misinterpretation. So what I've got up here is a graphic that I made. You can see that it says, uh, <laughs> um, created by Erica, compiled by Erica Gutsick-Given. 
and you see a lot of hominids here. So you've got, say, Helanthropus chidensis, you've got Ardipithecus ramidus here, you've got Australopithecus afarensis, Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus sediba. Down here at F, you have Homo habilis, followed by Homo rudolfensis, Homo gaudtingensis, if you accept it. Then you've got Homo georgicus, which some people think is uh, just Homo erectus. It depends on if you're a lump or a splitter with those. However, um, I'm sure we'll talk about it at a later date, why at least I think that the, the Dimonisi specimens are not Homo erectus, kind of sensu stricto. At J, you've got Homo ergaster. At K, you've got classic Homo erectus, the Tattersall Sawyer cast, which you can actually see behind me up here. At L, you have Homo heidelbergensis, or Homo rhodesiensis, depending on who you talk about. This is kind of an iffy taxon, too, as far as like where we're drawing these lines. Followed by Homo neanderthalensis at M. N is archaic Homo sapiens, and anatomically modern Homo sapiens is there at O. And if I flip on over to this guy over here, you can see that these are the same skulls kind of from the side. And the brain case sizes are changing, the prognathism is changing, the brow ridge size is changing, uh, things like that. So I would propose uh, at least that we're seeing, you know, a smooth transition from more primitive or basal states, character states, to more modern character states. And that there is no place for young earth creationists to say, these are the ape fossils and these are the human fossils, which is typically what they tend to do. Now, Todd, Wood, and Peter are more explicit in that they're not saying these are the ape fossils and these are the human fossils because if memory serves, they are quite okay with the notion that humans are technically primates, we're technically hominids, things like that. Uh, but they would say that we are not, that the hominid kind would not be like humans, chimps, gorillas, and orangutans, but rather it would be the non-human apes as kind of a part of a kind, the humans as a part of a kind, the australopiths as a part of a kind, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We'll get into that a little bit more in a second. I would of course propose that all the hominids are related by common ancestry, and this would include through uh, Sahelanthropus, uh, Ardipithecus, Australopithecus, down into Homo, and all the way to modern Homo sapiens. So let's move over to their paper and let's see what's going on. So to be abundantly clear, we've kind of got two hypotheses moving forward here. You've got mine, the one of conventional science, which is that if you look at the fossil record, there is a relatively smooth transition from basal character states to modern character states that go from kind of this Miocene ape looking thing to anatomically modern Homo sapiens over about 7 million years. And that there is no start point where you can draw a line and say, this group of morphologies are inherently different from this group of morphologies. Like, Australopithecines cannot cross the gap to become genus Homo uh, for one reason or another. I don't think that that exists. Todd and Peter, and I hope I'm not, you know, straw manning here. We're going to be going through the paper in pretty deep detail, so hopefully I, you know, will will fix it if I am straw manning it. But I would propose that what they're saying is that there is a line that can be drawn. You can group the Australopithecines with kind of a set of character states, and you can say that these guys all kind of cluster together, and Homo kind of clusters away from them, and that there is nothing bridging the gap, and that this gap is indeed quite stark. So, let's get into it. I realize this is kind of more of a technical video, but, um, you know, I, I like to do these kinds of things, so, uh, you know, what of it? You subscribe, you clicked on the video. This paper by Peter and Todd is titled Revising Hominin Baromenology with Metoid Partitioning and Fuzzy Analysis. So as the abstract here says, they're using statistics to see if you can actually uh, show that hominins cluster in a specific and stark fashion. And what they say is that their results show that you get two distinct clusters and that Homo naledi and Australopithecus sediba clump with Homo. This is something that brought down the ire of all other young earth creationists upon poor Todd and poor Peter because Australopithecus sediba is Australopithecus sediba is considered by conventional science to be a, a pretty solid Australopithecine. And to young earth creationists who are not Todd Wood and Peter, um, this is compromising or problematic or whatever. So this is this is the skull of uh, MH1, the child. Um, and this is uh, the interpretation of what perhaps an adult female Australopithecus sediba might look like. Um, they don't like this, the ones that are not Peter and Todd, uh, but we will get to that in a little bit. So they think that these guys would lump with the, kind of the human kind, the human baromen, hollow baromen, uh, as well as uh, Homo naledi, which looks like this, naledi. And it's important to note that, that we're really focusing on the anatomies here. We should be focusing on the anatomies much less than the reconstructions. But I do think that it's worth 
kind of looking at them because it's not like they're pulled out of nowhere. So you can see uh, Homo naledi is pretty primitive. This thing lived about 250,000 years ago, so that's also very recent to be having such primitive characteristics, but that's kind of a story for another time. So bopping back over to Todd Wood and Peter's paper, they start by summarizing the issue. And they kind of, you know, and this is perhaps another reason why, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for, for Todd and Peter, is that they know that there's some pretty big issues going on with, um, with creationism and young earth creationism and hominins that very few people tend to agree to the point that we've got some young earth creationists who are proposing that we actually have mixes of ape and human bones uh, as right here, or a mix of human and non-human remains from Rupin and Sanford, or the contested bones boys. Despite statistical baromenology results, Wood has also entertained the possibility that Australopithecus eva might not have been human. So they're like, all right, let's see what we actually reach here. Now, I want to be very clear. Um, <laughs> The Sanford and Rube, the contested bones guys who are saying that Australopithecus sediba is, is a mix of human and non-human remains. This is, this is like, putatively, putatively? Yeah, it's just ridiculous. Um, and we've gone over this extensively in other videos, but I'm sure we'll, well, I'm sure we'll be talking about it again eventually. So basically Todd and Peter want to resolve the problem specifically with three hominins that tend to be contentious, Australopithecus sediba, Homo floresiensis, and Homo naledi. The reason for this is Australopithecus sediba is thought of by conventional science as being a homo-like australopith. It's, it's transitional in nature, just as is Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis, but for the sake of today, they're focusing on Australopithecus sediba. Homo floresiensis, another problematic hominin, this is a hobbit. It's actually a species of uh, the genus of our homo genus that lived very recently in time, and it was like three and a half feet tall and lived on the island of Flores, which means it's got a really small brain case size and a lot of other very primitive features. And then there's Homo naledi, who we already talked about. This is a very recent but primitive looking uh, member of our genus. And they create this nice little matrix here where they're like, here's the list of creationists who think that uh, these hominins are not human. Here's a list of creationists who think that they're a mix of human and non-human. Hmm, notice it's Rupin and Sanford and Clary. And then there's the group that suppose that they are human, and then there's the, the undecided. Because if you're a young earth creationist, the, the, the non-human cannot transition into the human, so they have to, to clump rather distinctly. And then we get into, after our introduction, we get into our methods. This is really, really important. My advice for people who read scientific papers is if you're actually trying to discover how robust a paper is and whether or not you should kind of take its results seriously, you gotta look at the methods. The results aren't enough. You need to know how they actually arrived at the conclusions that they arrived at, because sometimes there are some confounding factors in there that maybe mean you should take the study with less weight. For instance, what if the sample size is really small, right? That can be quite problematic. Uh, and we're gonna kind of get into some of that now. So first they note that they're running a statistical analysis on a bunch of different characters of a bunch of different hominids in order to see if when you assess them all together, they cluster into two distinct groups or whether or not it's a continuum. And they propose that evolution would suggest that it is in fact a continuum. We're gonna talk a bit about that in a second because I, I would take a bit of issue with that simply because of the nature of the fossil record uh, and the nature of human attempts to categorize but give me a minute. So first they talk about the character sets. They say, we selected two character sets for our analysis. The first was derived from the original description of Australopithecus sediba by Berger et al. 2010. That's Lee Berger, who's also the discoverer of Homo naledi. This is going to be uh, important in a moment. And then they say, um, we also used, first they, they characterized Berger et al. 2012, or 2010's uh, character sets where they say it's 69 craniodental characteristics scored for 12 taxa. The taxa included three species of Paranthropus, four species of Homo, four species of Australopithecus, and chimpanzees, Pantroglodytes, as the outgroup. Okay, immediate uh, red flag here for me, at least, because what we're assessing is exclusively craniodental characteristics. This means characteristics of the skull and of the mouth, so teeth, right? Uh, this means we're not assessing any postcrania, which is kind of important when we're assessing relationships between organisms, because what is one of the primary characteristics that emerges slowly through time in human evolution? It's bipedality, and the efficiency of that bipedality, while it arrives, while bipedality arrives in Australopithecus, it continues to kind of hone itself and change into genus Homo. So it's critical that we include postcrania here. And, and to Todd Wood's credit, he talks about this later, about how he would have preferred it if he could have included 
included postcrania. Uh, and then they also scored it for 12 taxa. So this is like, this is a pretty good character set for 2010, uh, but the larger character set is down here. They talk about how for their, their second character set, they're using Dembo et al. 2016. Now, uh, Mana Dembo works with Lee Berger, which is again going to be kind of important in a moment. But first, let's talk about how they use these characters. So for the analysis, all characters were, uh, all character states were recorded that state zero always represented the absence of a character state because this is necessary for valid uh, Jacquard distance calculations and would not alter simple matching uh, barometric distance. We can talk about that in a minute. We might. I'm generally okay with that. The second character set was an updated super matrix compiled by Dembo et al. 2016. And here's what is included in Dembo 2016. This matrix includes additional character states de describing Artipithecus ramidus, um, also Pithecus adamensis, Homo antecessor, Homo floresiensis, uh, and an additional 55 Homo floresiensis character states were added by Todd. So the whole matrix includes 391 characters scored for 24 taxa that are available through uh, Dryad, and the taxa included Artipithecus, uh, Kenianthropus, Sahelanthropus, five species of Australopithecus, three species of Paranthropus, 11 species of Homo, and two outgroups, the chimpanzee and the gorilla. So um, this is obviously a significantly larger character set, but Todd runs it, Todd and Peter run it for both. So they run their analysis for Berger et al., which is 12 taxa and 69 characteristics, craniodental, and then they run it again for Dembo, which is 391 characters for 24 taxa. So over triple the characters for double the taxa. So the Dembo is probably, it's more comprehensive and you should keep that in mind as we move forward. But we also have to talk a little bit about both of these character sets. And I should also note that the Dembo character sets were also craniodental. So for this entire analysis, we're not including any postcrania. Um, that's kind of important. But before we continue onward, I simply must tell you a little bit about Lee Berger. Lee Berger is a paleoanthropologist. He is a cool guy. As you can see, he's found a lot of fossils. Lee Berger is the discoverer of not only Australopithecus sediba, but also Homo naledi, which are two pretty big, pretty important fossil finds, but also the sites are really, really awesome and are just vital to the study of paleoanthropology in South Africa, which is where he does the majority of his work. There is something you need to know about Lee, though. When he first published Australopithecus sediba, Lee was pretty convinced that it should be called Homo sediba. This is something that kind of got him in a little bit of trouble, if you will, with other paleoanthropologists who felt that he was kind of massaging his interpretation. This is where the beauty of peer review comes in because everyone else was kind of like, hey, Lee, hmm, I don't know that this belongs in Homo. And so he backtracked it and, and went with Australopithecus sediba. Homo naledi, Lee too, felt perhaps could be the base of Homo. He, this has been his search, um, self-diagnosed search, actually, self-proclaimed search, that he's trying to find the base of Homo, our genus, in South Africa. It's pretty, it's, it's, not, it's not uncommon to think that Homo evolved in South, in South Africa, but a lot of folks put it in East Africa, right? So around uh, Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia, these places in South Africa is pretty far from there. This isn't to say that there aren't hominins in South Africa. South Africa is incredibly rich when it comes to hominins, but most paleoanthropologists these days seem to point to East Africa as where it was kind of incepted. Lee still maintains that it's South Africa at his sites where Homo initially emerges. And it's this kind of sort of stance that made a lot of paleoanthropologists a little bit wary when Dembo et al. came out. Now, first, I, I want to be abundantly clear. I've heard nothing but good things about Lee, by and large. I think that everyone can be accused of having a bias. And it may be that Lee is biased in, like, for all the right reasons. He might be biased that Homo starts in South Africa because, you know, he's privy to evidence that is unpublished, or maybe he's working on interpretations that we haven't seen yet. Maybe he's right. We don't know that Homo didn't evolve in South Africa. We just can't make that claim just yet because Australopithecus sediba shows up at around 1.9 million years and Homo habilis shows up as early as 2.4 million years in East Africa. So clearly, because we have Homo habilis preceding Australopithecus sediba, it's not like Homo habilis came from it, if that makes sense. So 
Lee Berger um, <clears throat> perhaps might be a little overzealous in his calls sometimes. That doesn't mean he's not a fantastic paleoanthropologist in a lot of different ways. It just means sometimes he might jump the gun. Um, with that sort of careful tiptoeing about Lee around and out of the way, uh, let's talk about Dembo et al. 2016. Because um, <laughs> Mana Dembo, uh, as I've mentioned previously, uh, works with Lee, has worked with Lee, um, and did this assessment pretty soon after the Homo Naledi discovery. Um, and it should perhaps come as no surprise to you that her work here places Australopithecus sediba in the Homo genus, just like Lee initially intended. So let's talk about this paper, because this is going to have some important implications, not only for hominin phylogeny, but also for Todd Wood and, uh, and Peter's interpretation of this paper and usage of it within their own analysis. So let's, uh, let's tackle this bad boy and see what we get. The first thing that you need to know about this paper is that it compiles its phylogeny by running a Bayesian analysis on a super matrix. What is a super matrix, you might ask? Well, a super matrix is a combination of a bunch of different other matrices from other papers. And you might at first be thinking, wow, that's really good. You want to combine a bunch of different matrices together into one single matrix. And like the more data you have, the more robust the analysis. And a lot of times increasing sample size is a good thing. But in this case, your immediate concern should be redundancy, right? You're compiling a bunch of different matrices that are analyzing, you know, different kinds of hominins and character states are going to be different for each and every one. So for instance, if I have a character matrix that assesses Australopithecus, Australopithecus afarensis as prognathism as moderate, another one might say that the prognathism is extreme or uh, intense or um, something along those lines. They, they might differ. And in this case, the way that they kind of came to the conclusion of which character trait that they should use, if that is, um, if there's a, a disagreement there, is like for studies that reported character states for individual, individual fossil specimens, Dembo et al. 2015 used a 66 majority rule to code the characters. If less than 66% of the specimens exhibited a given character state, the species was coded as polymorphic. Um, that's not great, right? That's not great. This is going to lead, again, to some redundancy going on here. And we're also using craniodental, metric, craniodental metrics, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but it's a lot more dental than it is cranial. And dental characteristics are notorious for being bad for kind of um, recapitulating a, a good phylogeny. The reason is because they're highly adaptive. Teeth are pretty easy to adapt to a given environment, changing in diet, things like that, much more so than the entire complex that makes up the skull. So those two things are kind of immediately jumping out, kind of immediately jumped out at me um, as sort of issues. The high level of craniodental characteristics, meaning skewed towards dental, and the fact that we're using a 66% majority rule. Uh, another issue here is if you go and you actually track down some of these matrices, which I believe they talk about the specific ones here in the methods section. If I can find the methods section, there it is, materials and methods. Um, Part of the issue here, here we go, the supermatrix from 13 previous studies. Some of these are including characters that are like Miocene ape traits, which means they are basal to every single hominin. They're primitive compared to Artipithecus, Ramidus, which is like, it's a pretty primitive looking hominin. I'll show you right here. Already come down from there. Artipithecus Ramidus is like, it's pretty chimpish, right? It's pretty, it's pretty basal. Big canine teeth compared to the other hominins. Uh, pretty prognathic, small brain case, big brow ridge, things like that. Um, and so if you're using traits that are going, this is going to give like an artificial signal here, right? Because you're skewing everything modern in comparison to the extreme amount of basal Miocene ape traits that you might be using. Um, that's not great either. There are other concerns I have about this paper, though. They don't include apomorphies or unique derived characteristics of things like Homo naledi. This is again going to artificially skew the signal, and it kind of makes me wonder why they weren't included. There's also been disagreement about some of the things that they've scored, some of the characters that they've scored. So, for example, there is no canine fossa present in Homo naledi. 
Now, having a canine fossa is a primitive trait. We have a canine fossa. Humans do retain many of the primitive morphologies of hominins of years gone by. But Naledi lacks it. This means that lacking a canine fossa is an apomorphy of the species, but it's been incorrectly scored, and most morphology specialists are probably going to say that that is the case. So I've just given a lot of criticisms to this paper that I am obviously not on, and I'm just a PhD student. I am not a paleoanthropologist or biological anthropologist fully fledged just yet. But if it were up to me, and based off of criticisms that I've seen of this paper and heard of this paper, I would suggest that a better way of running this would be to do a similar analysis, but remove the redundancy from the super matrix, right? Make sure you're looking at characteristics that are applicable to hominins primarily, not all of these Miocene apes. This isn't going to help you when it comes to coming up with a phylogeny for hominins, right? Uh, I would also include as much post craning as I possibly could. Now, I know that that is going to be tough because hominins like, they're kind of biased towards heads. We have a lot of skulls for hominins and significantly less postcrania. Uh, but that doesn't mean we'd have no postcrania. In fact, there's a glut of postcrania for many different hominins, including the Australopithecines and genus Homo. So I don't know why we would, you know, leave the postcrania out when it could potentially be much more informative when it comes to actually sorting these guys, right? Because let's say, let's say Australopithecus sediba is very, very modern when it comes to the skull, but retains more primitive anatomies and morphologies when it comes to the postcrania. Well, then just assessing the skull is going to improperly push it towards homo. Taking these guys, you know, in, in their full suite of characteristics, in my opinion, would be best. But I also find it really interesting that Todd Wood used this paper given this figure here, figure three, which clearly shows, right, so let me explain the axes first. So we've got our sort of molecular clock for morphology on the y-axis and on the x-axis, we've got the geological date of the fossils. And we've got this nice legend over here telling us which symbols uh, represent which genera. Right? So paranthropists are going to be these boxes that are, you know, empty with the X in them, and the um, Australopithecines, excuse me, Artipithecus is circle, and Australopithecines are going to be triangles, and Kenianthropus, who's our odd man out, is down and out over here. Kenianthropus has only one representative. So one thing that you should kind of notice right away, right, is that as we get younger in geologic age, we see the disappearance of the Australopithecines and the arrival, as it were, of genus Homo. But this isn't stark, right? You seem to see this line that you could draw right here, and you could say, here's our Australopithecines and Artipithecus, and here's genus Homo. But that doesn't work, because in this lower clump, we've got Paranthropus, represented twice, and we've got the representation of Australopithecus. And that's probably Australopithecus sediba. That's Probably, in fact, almost definitely considering that's 1.9. But then what do you do about Homo landing anciently here in uh, Australopithecus as well? So I think that this graph in and of itself is kind of problematic for, for Todd and Peter. And I think really it's this x-axis that's the issue, right? It's the geological date. The date of these hominins is partially, it's the whole second half of the prediction that's made by evolutionary theory. It's morphologic change over geologic time. So not taking into account um, things like the geology is also going to falsely give the impression that this neat clustering is contemporaneous, that these, that these organisms cluster into Australopith-like apes and Homo-like apes, and that these things lived at the same time, but, but they abjectly did not. Uh, even if you're only using relative dating, which most creationists accept, right, that if it's found lower, it was deposited earlier, and if it's found in upper layers, it was deposited later, even if they do think it's during the global flood. So the Dembo usage, and, you know, I'm not going over Bernard, or not Bernard Wood, I always mix up Bernard Wood and Lee Berger. Um, I'm not using Berger in 2010, because it's basically exactly the same problems represented here. Uh, except with fewer taxa and fewer characteristics. So I think by using this one, we're actually kind of killing two birds with one stone. And if Peter or Todd disagrees, uh, please do let me know. So with in mind the fact that we're starting with a paper that is perhaps not the best for an analysis like the one that Todd and Peter are trying to perform, let's move forward and actually look at the paper that they wrote. I'd like to note here that if you would like to see the Dembo et al. supplementary material, which actually contains the list of characters that they scored, 
you can do that. You can download the supplementary material um, with you if you just go to the article. I was going to show it, but I don't actually know how to pull up the Word document. So I guess you're just going to have to check for yourself, but I guarantee you it's all craniodental. I mean, that's that's what it says in, in the paper. But if you wanna like look at which particular cusps are being assessed on which particular molars, you can certainly go and do that. Now, I wanna note something here as well. Todd, um, in the past, has evaluated um, these hominins using these particular character sets, which is probably why he's getting Australopithecus sediba as, as landing in Homo. It could be that the root of his entire problem uh, with the other creationists is kind of the, the input of his analysis, which are these character traits used by people who do actually think, you know, a priori, <laughs> that, um, that, that Australopithecus sediba belongs in genus Homo, um, which is, hmm, I don't know. I, I think that that's something to consider. I would consider that if I if I were Todd and if I were Peter. So let's move on. So you should note that what they're doing is they're running a couple of different statistical tests, right? And they're trying to discover these baromenic distances, right? They're trying to figure out if you can get this distinct clustering between Australopithecus, or rather with Australopithecus and with Homo, so as to say they cluster, they're distinct kinds, um, and there's not this kind of middle area that evolution would, in their opinion, predict. Now I said I was going to talk about this earlier. Yes, if we had access to a perfect fossil record all the way back to the most universal common ancestor of all life, you would find a smooth gradient of change. It would be literally impossible to point out a single species because the change would be so smooth. Unfortunately, the fossil record is very incomplete. And even though we are fortunate with the hominins because of the areas and, and um, habitats that they lived in to have a very robust fossil record for them, the fossil record isn't going to be perfect. And whenever you've got kind of a scattershot of data, you might see artificial clustering. And you might hear me say that, and you might say that feels a little bit like motivated reasoning, that I want it to be artificial clustering, uh, and so therefore this is the wording that I'm using. This is actually Todd's wording, so we're going to get there in a second. So they discussed kind of what they're doing. Um, really and truly, I, I don't have an issue with the statistics. I actually don't think that I'm well versed enough in statistics to have a problem with it, right? I understand Spearman and Pearson correlations and you know kind of what they're what they're doing here, generally speaking, with the partitioning. Um, but really, what I'm trying to do here isn't criticize the methods of statistics that they're using. I want to just interpret the paper as it is, with my knowledge and my background in in hominins and in primates in general. So let's read what they've got. So they discuss um, kind of what they're going to do here. This is critical, right? This section right here is going to be critical and I'm going to tell you why, because like I said, this is going to be kind of a technical video. So I'm gonna kind of tell you how to interpret these graphs to the best of my ability. So they notice that we're trying to see these clusters and we're going to assess these clusters by use of silhouette widths and average silhouette widths. Um, and we're gonna talk about that in just a second. But first I want you to appreciate the silhouette widths and what the numbers mean. So silhouette widths are going to vary between negative one to one, where negative values indicate that a taxon is closest to its nearest neighbor cluster than it is to the taxon, sorry, than it is to the taxa in the cluster uh, to which I has been assigned. The average silhouette, mit, silhouette width is the mean of the silhouette widths of all taxa in the distance matrix. Then they use Kaufman and Rousseau, which I'm hoping I'm saying correctly from 1999, and they say how we're supposed to interpret these numbers that we're getting for the silhouette widths, which is accordingly. They say anything above 0.5 is going to be considered reasonable or strong clustering. So if we see 0.5 or above, this is considered a true cluster. But if it's below 0.5, so specifically 0.26 to 0.5, it's going to be weak or possibly artificial clustering. And lower than that is just you can't even call it clustering at all right so from the perspective of evolution um we would expect that we should have no substantial structure at all if we had a perfect fossil record but because we have a per an imperfect fossil record we should see at least some clustering because we're basically scatter shotting right it would be like if i took for instance a color gradient red to yellow color gradient let me show you what i mean here Hopefully it's going to show me an actual gradient gradient. Here it is. Okay. If I look at this and I say to you, I want you to tell me where yellow emerges on this color gradient. 
Um, it's going to be pretty hard, right? Because pretty much this entire area right here is like orange yellow. And if I asked you to tell me where red emerges, it's hard because this entire area right here is like scarlet or red orange. That's tough. The fossil record, if it was perfect from evolution standpoint, would look like this. But it's not. So instead, you can pick about nine different spots. You know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And it's those spots that you can kind of group. Right? You can say some of these spots, if we were just to take, you know, nine random points, some of the spots are going to be closer to red, some are going to be closer to the middle, and some are going to be closer to yellow. And from an evolutionary standpoint, this is okay. We do see clustering. It's those clusters that we use to determine genera in the fossil record, right? This is all business as usual. So Another issue that I have that I would propose to Todd and Peter now that I've read the paper is how does your methodology differentiate between the reality of what we see in the fossil record and in accordance with what evolutionary theory has said about that incomplete record from the very beginning. So moving backwards, right? We should, for our purposes, expect that if evolution is kind of more in the correct here, that we should see these kind of weaker clusterings. And really and truly, even these strong clusterings, given the fragmentary nature of the fossil record, I don't, I don't see it as problematic. And I don't think that Todd and Peter necessarily do either. They are notorious for not proposing that the evolution, the evidence for evolution is weak. They just think that the evidence for creationism is stronger. So I would imagine that if I brought this to, to Peter and Todd's attention, that they would kind of take the perspective of like, yeah, okay, except if it's above five, even though that might not preclude evolution, we think that it's, it's closer to creationism. Um, but let's continue on for now. This is the big important spot right here, the results section. So we get a bunch of different results here, and they note that for that first set of characteristics with the much smaller character set and the much fewer taxa, so 69 characters uh, across 12 different taxa, that the silhouette width that they got was about 58 to 59, 0.58 to 0.59. Okay, that's pretty strong clustering, right? Across 12 taxa? Yeah, okay, that's exactly what they set up here. You know where we also saw strong clustering? Back in the 40s, when we had very few fossil hominins, maybe five or six, and it was very easy to draw the lines between them and say, this is an Australopithecine, this is Paranthropus, and this is Homo. Because, again, we had that scatter shot. Moving back to our color gradient, it would be like having, oops, it would be like messing up on a stream or on a recording. It would be like having yellow here, and then yellow-orange here, and then orange here, and then red-orange here, and then red, right? These are very easy to group as their respective categories. But when you have the full representation, it gets harder. What this means, and this is my thesis statement, as the fossil record becomes more complete, it becomes harder, not easier, to, de to determine where genera begin and end, and species for that matter. This is simply the nature of life, if evolution is in fact correct. So, okay, cool, we've got that 0.58 and 0.59. Oh, you might be thinking, okay, cool, um, a 0.4 creationism. But again, this is that fewer sample set. The real critical part here is going to be, how does this change or not when we increase the sample size? Not just increase it, double it. So let's continue moving on. Um, and from what they noticed right off the bat, right here was their barometric distances from Berger et al. And you can see that there's this nice stark gap here. You can cluster these guys together and you could potentially cluster these guys together. So we move forward, right? And they, they talk a little bit about who is landing where in particular. And specifically, they note that, yeah, we're putting Australopithecus sediba with Homo, much like Dembo et al. did in their initial analysis, the analysis that Wood and Peter chose to use. So I would imagine that from Todd's perspective, at least, Peter's a young man, so he might not have been privy to this, but I would imagine from Todd's perspective, this wouldn't be that much of a surprise. Yeah? Okay. So, and we continuously over the Pearson's and Spearman correlations and the metoid partitioning, the fuzzy analysis, regardless of which statistical measure we're using, we're still getting like pretty much three groups for all of them, three different clusters uh, with HOMO, with the Australopiths and Panans, and with Paranthropus. Okay, cool, you might be saying. So let's continue downward to the rest of our results. So now they talk about the different kinds of results that they got when they used 
burger, or not burger, excuse me, Dembo et al. And this is that chart. The taxonomic partitions and average silhouette widths based on distance correlations for the character set of Dembo et al. 2016, as updated by Wood 2020A. Clusters are indicated by number and by color, with putative humans in shades of green and putative homin non-humans in shades of blue. Uncert uncertain taxa are shown in orange. Let's break this down. The first thing that you need to know about interpreting this graph is that the species are, of course, on the Y here and on the X is the specific statistical analysis that we're doing. The numbers in the boxes are just telling you how many different clusters we got for that given analysis. So for instance, in this first column right here, we see two ones, three threes, one two, one four, and a whole bunch of fives for a total of five different clusters. Yeah? And this changes a little bit depending on which kind of test we're doing. But what I want to draw your attention to is the average silhouette width down here. 0 0.37, 0 0.38, 0 0.37, 0 0.35, 0 0.31, 0 0.38, 0 0.31, and 0.37. These are all, every single one of them, under the minimum amount, 0.5, in order to get strong or at least evident clustering. All of these are weak clusters. Um, and artificial is the word that, that would note it up top, potential artificial clustering. So. The conclusion here, at least thus far in the paper, is that when you compare the smaller data set to the larger one, as you increase the data set, the clusters become harder to form, just like it would with a color gradient and just like evolution would predict. So let's continue onward now. The last major table that Peter and Todd uh, kind of put up here First of all, uh, th you can appreciate that this is um, this figure five is is significantly different than the figure that we saw using Burger 2010. Once we include the updated character set with 24 different taxa and nearly 400 characters, um, there isn't a clustering here. There is no place to draw the line. It becomes very difficult. And this first set here that we ran, right, that they ran, was based on distance correlation. It actually gets worse when they use the cluster analysis. So here's the cluster analysis, table four. It's very similar to the table that we just saw. It's using, again, that big character set. Um, so the only, you basically have three tables, and the difference is one used burger, two of them used Dembo, um, and one of the Dembos used um, cluster analysis. That's this one, and the one we just looked at previously used distance correlation. So I believe it was distance correlation. Let me double check. Yes, distance correlation. So for this one, let's look at those silhouette widths. Remember, for strong clustering, you need 0.5 or above. We have 0 0.36, 0 0.36, 0 0.36, 0 0.34, 0 0.41. That's kind of nice. 0 0.39, 0 0.40, 0 0.37, 0 0.19, 0 0.16, 0 0.20, 0 0.19, 0 0.43. That's okay. 0 0.39, 0 0.39, and 0.37. So the clustering, the cluster analysis actually shows less of a cluster between these groups. And what's interesting to me is this section right here, the fuzzy analysis where k is equal to 3. And what we see is that the clusters are effectively all of the australopithecines, right? And then HOMO, Putative Homo, and then in their own groups, we have Georgian Homo erectus, Homo rudolfensis, Homo habilis, and Australopithecus sediba. So for these approximately four groups here, um, and then, uh, Homo floresiensis lands with them, the clusters that we get are Australopithecus and apes, transitionals, so Australopithecus sediba and early Homo, late Australopithecus, early Homo, and then late Homo which is what evolution would, of course, predict. These groups become somewhat transitional. And it is, of course, this section that has these lowest silhouette widths. So you might be wondering at this point, what does Todd have to say about this? What did Todd and Peter note? And I was very, very happy with how they reported this. They were very honest. The fact that this came out at all um, greatly increased my respect for Peter and Todd, both of whom clearly care about having methodologies to put with their model and not just saying that it's true and using sneaky tactics and trickery to get there. So 
what they discuss on. I'm going to put it in the description um, as well so that everybody can go and read it for themselves and, you know, blow me to kingdom come if I've gotten anything wrong. Because I really mean this. The last thing I want to do is misrepresent these two guys. They are doing what every single creationist should be doing. They're actually trying, right? That's what we want to see. So they know that this discussion is effectively here to say, regardless of the character set that you use, whether you're using Burger or Dembo, you still end up with Australopithecus sediba and Homo naledi clumping in genus Homo, which is again, partially the point of this, because so many young Earth creationists were giving Todd Wood so much flack about putting them in our genus, in the humankind, so to speak, because they are indeed so primitive in so many different traits. But they still discuss the analysis that they presented in the figures that they noted. They say, the placement of Australopithecus africanus seems much more certain, but questions remain. In Wood's 2010 original analysis, three character sets he examined yielded significant positive distance correlations between Australopithecus africanus and other members of Homo. After discussing that, Wood kind of goes on, Wood and Peter go on to discuss the lack of consensus between the three major tables. They say the lack of consensus might cause us to question the utility of Wood's character matrix. This skepticism could be justified by the lower average silhouette widths from partitions calculated from this character set, which fall in the upper range of what Kaufman and Rousseau subjectively dodged to be weak clustering. Still, the general results from these characters seem quite clear. Australopithecus sediba and Homo naledi consistently group with the indisputably human taxa, and then they list those. Only three cluster fuzzy analysis separates the putative human cluster for into two groups, resulting into insubstantially lower average silhouette widths, which therefore justifies our skepticism of this outcome. Otherwise, the primary question seems to be the placement of Homo floresiensis, which in distance correlation falls into a singleton. So they talk about how, regardless of how you run it, Floresiensis the Hobbit ends up problematic in every single in every single analysis, which is something that I sympathize with. There's nothing like an anomaly screwing up your data set and being difficult. Um, but what they basically said here is like, yeah, there there should be potentially a bit of skepticism uh, with regard to the weak clustering. But they still note that Naledi and Australopithecus sediba, Homo Naledi and Australopithecus sediba, should go ahead and be within the human taxa, which appears to be the primary purpose of this paper, not whether or not the clustering is strong or not. So what this leads me to the conclusion of, I suppose I should say, is that while this does present a case that Australopithecus sediba in particular should be within the Homo genus, I think it's flawed from the start because of the character matrix that it uses, the super matrix from Dembo et al., which is itself problematic in my opinion. But even if it was perfect, we need to appreciate the fact that the clustering is still very weak comparatively when we use more taxa, which is again, precisely what evolution would predict. The more the fossil record fills in, the harder it should become to draw the lines. And that's what we see here. So there's one last thing that I want to discuss here. Um, again, after complimenting Todd Wood and Peter, who are both incredibly intelligent people, and they have my respect just for the sheer attempt of it all, just for actually putting this out there um, and making an effort to, to actually create a model for, for you know, their ideas on human origins and the age of the earth. I want to say that I appreciate that, and I, I mean that no gags, no memes, no jokes. I think Peter's an intelligent young man, and he's going to can go out there and do some really cool things. I really do. But I want to add one last problem here, and that's the nature of the kinds. So this paper, as you will recall, sort of makes the general claim, despite the average silhouette widths, let's just go up and let's just use the smaller data set. And let's just say that this is the right data set, okay? This is the correct one. Let's pretend like all of the issues that I had don't exist. And let's take this at face value. We have a homo kind, right? We have a kind of Australopithecines and respective extant apes, specifically Pantroglodytes, and we have a Paranthropus kind. Okay, but all of these guys still fall into the family of Hominidae. Which, if you will look for a moment to Todd Wood's other work, which is titled A Brief Review of Morphology-Based Baromenology, talking about Reeves, who's another young earth creationist, you can see that 
hollow barabins or just barabins uh, are listed over here on the right and nearly every single one of the kinds that's presented ends in day which is at the family level so there is a massive inconsistency here and maybe todd and peter have an answer for it and i just haven't seen it because i'll admit i've read this that we've got here and i've read this paper here and that's really all i've read to cover this video um, because I'm taking these papers at face value. So maybe they've covered this elsewhere, but there's an inconsistency. And to me, at present, it's pretty problematic. Because what they've basically said is that the kind level works at the family level for everything except hominins, where it's at the genus level. That's not good practice. And for folks who are you know, presenting methodology here, I would appreciate at some point, and maybe it exists again, maybe I just haven't seen it, an explanation for that. Why does the kind work, the kindless work at the family level for all of these guys, for hyena day, fila day, ursa day, uh, ataria day, so those are, you know, hyenas, felines, bears, and uh, otters, etc. But not actually, or otaria day I think might be seals, but not for the hominins. And I looked here, I tried to find, like, hominidae is not here, hominidae is not present. So they basically ex assessed everything besides the apes, because I'm, I'm fairly certain that they cover other primates. Um, yes, Lemaridae, Lepilemaridae, Loridae, um, they're covering other primates here, but they're leaving out the apes. And I'm curious as to why that is. So, allow me to summarize my thoughts. Todd Wood and Peter have created a paper that relies on a character matrix, a character super matrix that is itself problematic. The reason the character matrix itself is problematic is because it doesn't include apomorphies of things like Homo naledi. It is redundant in the characters that it uses. It is exclusively craniodental and primarily dental, which can be, you know, a bit, a bit of a, a bit of a no-no. And some of the characters are scored incorrectly with regard to the consensus without reasoning for why they are correct and the rest of the consensus is incorrect, which is generally good practice. So that's the problem with Dembo et al., a conventional science paper that is utilized within Wood and Peter's paper, right? Berger et al. has the same problem, so that applies to both of them. When that character matrix is used, there are still issues. Clustering is weak, which is the, the primary problem that I saw with it, uh, specifically the fact that it's weak in comparison to when you use fewer taxa and fewer traits. That relationship is the main problem here. If they just done one or just done the other, I think the problem would honestly be less evident. It's the fact that when you add more characters and when you add more taxa, the lines become blurrier, then it becomes problematic because it's effectively mimicking that evolutionary prediction that I mentioned earlier. So that's not great. And then the second part of the paper that I have a problem with is the fact that it's separating on the genus level, whereas Todd consistently separates on the family level in other places. All in all, I can't express enough how much I appreciate that this paper was, was created, was written, and was submitted. I have the utmost respect again for Peter and for Todd, and I don't mean this as any kind of dunk or disrespect to them and the work that they have done. I'm simply acting as a peer reviewer here. Um, granted, a peer reviewer who disagrees with them, but I think that that's the most peer review, to be quite honest. Um, and, and I think that more than anything, that that's my way of showing respect to them and the work that they've done. So, Peter, you're always welcome on the channel. Todd Wood is always welcome on the channel if they'd like to come and discuss this with me. I would love to defend my points to the best of my ability. And thank you so much for being here. My concluding thesis statement is, of course, that I think hominin evolution is, in fact, a smooth gradient given the fossil record that we have. I think that we do see slow morphologic change over geologic time, and I think that uh, something that most young Earth creationists would do well to consider is the fact that it is that geologic time that is the whole second half of this prediction, right? It's the whole second half of the idea uh, that we're seeing this change sort of through this time, this deep time um, as well. Of course, that includes radiometric dating, and, and you can get into the weeds there. But even if you take that out, I think what we're seeing is a lack of a, of a you know, distinct cluster going on here. 
And so, my gentle and, of course, very modern apes, thank you so much for being here, and uh, please do take care of yourselves. Thank you.